people should start filling in. We'll get started in just a few minutes. I'm going to give everybody time to get in. What did you say, Kelsey? I said that we would start in just a few minutes. I'm just going to wait. Um, do you know how many are registered, Cass? Um, let me look. I know that you have 10 in right now. Let me check. I'll just give it one more minute. Um, for everyone who's already here, you might want pen and paper just to write down um, some notes for a couple of activities. You can. You had fifteen registered. You got twelve here. <laughs> okay. I'll just wait one moment. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got 14. Um, so <clears throat> I'm Kelsey Wileen. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. And we're gonna talk about um, some of the common behavioral challenges in early childhood and how we can analyze those behaviors to really figure out what's going on and intervene better in the classroom and at home. 
Um, whoops. Sorry. Okay. Um, so if you want to get a pen and paper to write down some things, um, you can do that now. And then we'll start just by kind of listing some of the common behavioral challenges that we observe in early childhood. And I cannot see people. So if you wanna throw some of those out um, into the chat. Sorry. Oh, hi Candy, sorry to Emma chat, open. So what are some of the common behaviors that you guys see in your classrooms or even at home with your own kids? Yep, throwing toys, things like aggression. Screaming. <laughs> um, also things like lying and deceitfulness in those older kids. I really wish this was like, I wish I could see all your faces. Uh -huh, defiance and refusal, fighting, those are great. Um, yep. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Okay, tantrums, throwing, hitting, biting, saying no, all of those are fantastic, whoops. Um, okay, so think about a behavior that's challenged you either with a kid in your classroom, current or in the past or a child of your own and take a minute to reflect on it and write down some things about that behavior. What did it look like? How often did it occur? Um, was there a time or place that it seemed to occur most often? And then most importantly, one thing that we tend to overlook when we're trying to intervene with behaviors is how did that behavior make you feel in those moments? And I will give y'all a minute for that. I'm going to assume that everyone's ready. So the first thing that you kind of want to look at when you notice um, a pattern of behaviors is we wanna look at the common causes and the setting events. And we'll get into it later. You know, the antecedents and setting events are two separate things, but they're both, they're both very important to develop that entire package of treatment. So a lot of the things that we see in early childcare settings is communication deficits. Even if a child doesn't have, um, you know, a disability like autism or ADHD, children do develop communication at different ages. And, they're still learning when they're toddlers. So their communication skills aren't going to be fantastic anyway. So we have to teach them that. So communication deficits, a lack of boundaries that are age appropriate, changes in family dynamics or routines, um, reinforcement or consequences that lack functional equivalence. And we'll get into that one more in a little bit as well. Lack of routine or consistency, social emotional deficits and trauma. Um, a lot of times it's easy for us to think, well, you know, they know better, or you know, these are the rules, and we feel like the behaviors are this intentional defiance. And sometimes it may be, but a lot of times it really is due to, to a setting event that we don't understand or a skill deficit that we need to teach in order to replace that behavior appropriately. Um, and then the effects of challenging behaviors on other children in your classrooms or siblings of the child that's demonstrating problematic behavior. Um, those things can be secondary trauma. It, it elicits that fight or flight response. And so if you have two children at home and one of them is having these really aggressive outbursts and, and violent tantrums and things like that, it does affect every other member of the family as well. Um, the same thing can happen in the classroom. Um, it decreases learning opportunities, not only for the child engaging in the behavior, but also for all the other children in the environment, whether it be a classroom or a home environment. And the routines are disrupted um, or disrupted. Parents are obviously frustrated, whether it's occurring in their home or they're having to deal with it secondarily as it occurs in the classroom. Your staff burns out. Nobody wants to get up and go to work every day, but they know they're going to wake up and they're going to get there and their entire day is going to be behavior management. Um, and then the monkey see, monkey do syndrome. One kid in your classroom starts rolling around on the floor and then all the other kids say, hey, that looks like a great time everyone's rolling in the floor and nothing's getting done and your teacher's not having a fun day. 
Um, and then so what is behavior anyway? I know that sounds kind of silly, but I feel like a lot of people outside of um, kind of the behavioral hub of things, they tend to use the word behavior as an exclusive term to describe problematic behavior. And so in ABA, we say, does it pass the dead man's test? If a dead person can do it, then it's not behavior. Anything else is in fact a behavior. <clears throat> if we were in person, this would be a game, but we're not. So um, we're gonna kind of just kind of set the stage for all of it, thinking of functionality and things like that with comparing what we do as behaviorist um, to taking your child to the doctor. So imagine you take your child to the doctor and they have strep throat. And so you're in the waiting room and there are three other parents in there too with their children. One child has a broken arm, one's having a mental health crisis and the other has a cut on their leg that needs stitches. If the doctor treated every child with a cast on their arm, because that's just what they knew how to do, um, only that one kid is going to get better from what, what they came in for. The other kids are not receiving the treatment they need. They're not gonna get better and they're probably going to get worse. And so when you take your child to the doctor, you expect that doctor to provide you or your child with a treatment that is, is individualized and based on the specific symptoms and ailments and not just a Band-Aid that's universal. So you can compare that to things kind of like timeout or these basic classroom management strategies that we tend to use. And, and we think, well, this is gonna fix it. Um, and sometimes it may, but oftentimes it doesn't because we're not really getting to the root of it. And that kind of goes along. There's a story, um, one of my favorites there, there was, um, a boy that I worked with one time, um, in a classroom and he was biting and hitting, just really having a, a really difficult time all of the time. And the teacher called me in and she was like, I'm doing everything right. We're putting him in timeout every time it happens, but I feel like he just likes timeout and he absolutely did. Timeout was where he could live his best life because he did not want to play with the other children. And he was very motivated by his preferred tangibles. And so when he wouldn't sit in the timeout chair because he was trying to get back to the tangibles, which resulted in more hitting and biting and screaming, they would give him a tangible to sit in timeout with. And they were like, well, we're teaching him to sit in timeout. <laughs> And that's, you know, that's all well and fine, but learning to sit in timeout isn't nearly as important as learning to socialize and communicate. So they were inadvertently reinforcing the behavior by putting him in timeout, which they assumed was a punisher. And all of that'll come full circle in a moment. Um, so the functions of behavior, um, you can remember the acronym SEAT, sensory, escape, attention, or tangible. If a behavior is maintained by a sensory function, then it's something that's that's internal. Things like chewing maybe could be a, um, a sensory thing or that like a vocal stem, um, rocking back and forth, even like head banging, things like that can be sensory. Not always, but typically um, those are some of the sensory maintained behaviors that you'll see. Um, escape, trying to get out of a situation or a task or away from a certain adult or peer attention, self-explanatory, um, and then tangible things like toys, anything that you can physically touch, um, food, things like that. Sorry. Um, and then consequences. Consequences, the, the term consequences does not equate to punishment. And I think a lot of times that's one of those terms that we kind of get confused when we're trying to analyze a behavior. So a consequence is simply anything that occurs immediately following a behavior. And the four types of consequences are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Positive reinforcement is any stimulus that's added that increases the likelihood that a behavior will occur again in the future. So for example, a child earns a reward for demonstrating an appropriate behavior. Negative reinforcement is a stimulus that's removed that increases the likelihood of that behavior occurring again. So you'll see this one a lot of times, like a little kid um, is scared of dogs. And so when they see a dog, they cry and then you know their parents put the dog away or they remove the child. In the future, the child's less likely to engage in crying in the, in the presence of a dog because in the past, it has removed that um, aversive stimuli from the environment. Reinforcement is typically always thought of as being positive. However, like the example with the little boy who loved timeout, um, when we don't understand the function of a child's behavior, you can inadvertently reinforce those undesired behaviors. 
And so that can look like giving a child what they want because they're engaging in a tantrum. And um, sorry, and that, well, let me just explain that in a second. Reinforcement is any event that immediately follows a behavior that increases the likelihood that it will occur again in the future. If it does not occur, then the intended reinforcement wasn't actually a reinforcer at all. So um, going back to thinking um, about how you feel during those behaviors that you're trying to manage, if you have a child that's having a tantrum because they want a cookie and they're screaming, you eventually give them the cookie. Both of you are experiencing reinforcement. The child's receiving positive reinforcement and you're receiving negative reinforcement. The next time that happens, you're both more likely to engage in the behaviors that get the cookie or the toy or whatever it may be, and that made the crying stop. And so our own behavior really does play a huge role into developing these patterns that then we have to figure out how to intervene with. Um, same is true with um, punishment, positive punishments, anything that's added that decreases the likelihood of a behavior occurring. So corporal punishment is kind of an easy example to understand not that we do that in childcare, but um, you know, it's a, it's a an easy one to understand. So the aversive stimuli is being added, child's less likely to engage in the behavior. Negative punishment, um, things like timeout or the loss of a privilege, some things being removed that decreases the likelihood of that behavior occurring again. And as with reinforcement, punishment is only actually punishment if the behavior is decreased in the future. So timeout boy, that was not actually a punishment, though it may have been for other children. For him, it was the happiest place on earth. And then we have the ABCs. I think most people who work in childcare are, are on some level familiar with that ABC data that we'll take. So the antecedent is what occurred immediately before the behavior occurred. And that's really important. This is where some of, sometimes the setting events come into it. We'll say, oh, well, like Susan, hit Johnny because she was sleepy. Very well could be a factor in that, but that's not why she engaged in the behavior. So it's whatever immediately occurred before the behavior. And then the behavior is exactly what was observed, observable and measurable. What did it look like? How long did it last? Um, all of those variations are really important. And it's only what you can observe. We cannot we, we can take a guess at how someone may be feeling, but we don't know. So if you can't see it with your own eyes, then it's not, you, you cannot reliably call that a behavior, if that makes sense. Um, and then the consequences, whatever occurred immediately after the behavior, not what, not what happened five minutes later, immediately after the behavior, that's the consequence that's going to maintain or reduce the behavior in the future. Um, and back to setting events and antecedents. Um, the setting events are environmental factors and they are contributing factors. They're very important to note and to keep record of, um, but we, we can't report that as part of the analysis. Okay. I really thought that the format of this, I'd be able to see everybody <laughs> and we could talk about it. Um, I don't know if scenarios are gonna work out in the chat box. Yeah. Hey, Kelsey. Yeah. We can't change it right now, but if you need me to help facilitate with the chat box, I can. Okay. Does anybody want to like throw out some <laughs> scenarios? If you guys can throw out any scenarios that you have that you have the behaviors with, and let's see if Kelsey can help you walk through them. Probably just going to take him a minute to type it. Teasing. Jamie said teasing. A child refuses to clean up. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, a child calling another name is picking on them. I don't know if this is going to work out through a chat box where I don't think we can get the information we need, like as quickly to have the conversation. Let's move, just move on from this and then we can circle back and do some Q and A or something. Does that work? Yeah, that's fine. 
Okay, sorry. <clears throat> if you guys want to start uh, typing up like your scenarios of what happens before and after and all that stuff, just start, you know, even if you need to type it up and set it to the side, like copy and paste it somewhere. That way, whenever the time comes, Kelsey can walk through those things with you. Or I can try to come up with an example. I mean, we can go back to daycare boy with the, the kid who loved timeout. Um, so in that situation, they thought that, you know, they were just trying to punish the observable behavior of biting and hitting by putting him in timeout without understanding the function. So when I went in and I realized that he was very into these toys, that was always the, the antecedent, right? Somebody would approach him when he had the toys or somebody would say, it's my turn with that. He'd lose it, bite somebody, push someone down, throw a toy across the room, whatever the case may be. And then he was put into timeout as punishment, which as we discussed was his happy place. Um, so now that we've determined that function, that the, the function of that behavior was actually to access tangibles. Does anyone have something that would be quicker to put in the chat box? Uh, um, what could they have done differently instead? Understanding why that behavior is occurring, what would be a better alternative than timeout? Yeah, give them child options. Um, also think, how about like things like timers? You know, we can work on those interpersonal skills of sharing and functional communication, teaching a child to say not right now, or it's my turn. And then reinforcing that. That's another thing that we kind of lose sight of is that it's okay to say no sometimes. And in that moment, it's more, it's more important to teach that child how to use their words and to communicate their wants and needs than it is maybe to, to really reinforce the idea of sharing in that moment <clears throat> and I do believe that's the um, the strategy we actually took with that child was we went really heavy into turn taking using a timer um termination cues and functional communication training oh my god I did it again sorry and then so functional equivalence what is it and why is it important we can't just take a behavior away. We want a child to stop hitting. We can't just remove that from their repertoire because it's occurring for a reason. Um, all behavior is functional, at least you know, for the person who is demonstrating that behavior. So functional equivalence refers to multiple behaviors that serve the same function. For example, crying for a cookie and asking for a cookie, they serve the same purpose to get the cookie. However, asking for it is more appropriate to obtain the desired outcome. If the function behavior is access to tangibles, the cookie, replacing the crying behavior with anything that does not lead to that child getting the cookie isn't going to work. If you simply punish that behavior, it, the, the tantruming and the crying may reduce, but other behaviors are going to surface in its place because they still don't have a more functional way to have that need met. The replacement has to equate and them getting the desired reinforcer or it will not be effective. And so we have a little game, not game. We're going to watch this video and see if you guys can take some ABC data on the behavior that you're going to see. For the sake of time, um, yeah, for the sake of time, I'm going to just 
and that one there. Oh my God, I lost my presentation. Okay. Um, it, the kid tantrums in the end. He, he continues to tantrum and then um, the teacher just kind of gets him cleaned up and they move along. Um, but in that video, it's, can you guys, um, what was, I mean, what was the antecedent in that situation? He dropped his peaches and then the behavior, the observable and measurable behavior was the tantrum. What did that look like? He kind of cried a little. He dramatically fell out of his chair. Um, he did ask for more. That wasn't an option. And then we cut that up before the consequence, but anyways, okay. Data or it didn't happen. Um, you, you have to collect your data to analyze the data to find the solution, determine the setting events, isolate the triggers or the antecedent, what happened exactly before, um, and then paying attention to locations, times they're most likely to, to occur and hypothesize the function. You also have to consider any skill deficits or delays, trauma, and all of, all of those things that could be contributing. One data point is not sufficient. You have to look at trends over time. We can't say on this day, this behavior occurred because this happened and make a whole plan based off of that. We need at least five to seven data points to really establish a baseline before you can truly intervene. Um, so to build those interventions, we need antecedent modifications, prevention. What can we do to prevent this behavior from occurring? If you know that certain peers are triggering or certain timing, certain times of the day, certain events, um, what can we put into place during those times to make that easier? Replacement behaviors, what's our functional equivalent replacement? Is there a skill deficit that needs to be taught first? Are we lacking prerequisite skills? If we can't speak, we can't obviously teach you know, a whole functional request for something. So where do we need to start? And then the consequences, how should we respond when this behavior occurs in the future? Common antecedent strategies, um, really making eye, eye contact, getting down on that child's level to get their attention, provide warning and termination cues, five more minutes, three more minutes. Um, sometimes that needs some shaping. They might not be able to wait for five minutes. They might not understand how to track that amount of time. They may need a visual timer. Um, or shape it, you know, waiting for 30 seconds and then shaping it up from there until they're able to respond to that five minute cue. Um, stating the end of the activity as it follows to the next one, again with the visual. Five more minutes, we're gonna clean up and then um, individual prompts and visual schedules to transition photographs or objects to re represent the next activity. Um, review of rules and expectations of the child prior to the activity or the transition, um, reading a scripted story, providing the child with explicit choice of materials to use within an activity or forced choices. Examples of interventions, functional communication training, play and social skills training, forced choices plus reinforcement, um, shaping, overcorrection. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. I do, let's see. Let's do, let's do overcorrection. Hi, I'm Christina Saint, and I'm working on um, overcorrection tonight, and I'm going to be using my son, Tristan, um, and here is his permission to be used in this video. Tristan, do I have your permission? Yes, you do. Are you sure? I promise. Okay. Okay, here we go. Hey, 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 that's not how we close the door. You need to close that the right way. Is that better? Let's try one more time. Okay, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, overcorrection is something that is pretty easy to use. It's um, actually a punishment procedure because you are adding something to the situation that decreases the likelihood of reoccurrence. Um, positive practice. So a lot of, oh no, what's happening? Um, sorry. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those, um, like cleaning up and throwing things like that, that you guys mentioned earlier, um, overcorrections, a great one for that. I will send these slides out to you guys because we're not, we're running out of time and I don't want to be disrespectful of your time. 
Um, things to consider, this is an important one, when you are determining how you're gonna intervene, can you really ignore this behavior if that's gonna be your approach? Probably not, at least not in a classroom setting, depending on the behavior. Um, are you intermittently reinforcing the behavior? If you are not consistent, that is one thing that really increases behavior over time and really solidifies that learning history. It's the same thing with a vending machine or gambling. You're probably gonna lose if you go and play the slot machine, but that small chance of winning is gonna keep you coming back to see if you can get it. Um, the same thing with behavior. So consistency and follow through is always the most important thing you can do when you're, inter when you're intervening. Um, what happens when you remove a child from your classroom? What does that signal to the child? Sometimes that's appropriate, but being mindful of when that's used. And then consider what you're gonna do if you have a rescuer, another teacher in the classroom, another staff member, or you know, another parent at the park, whatever the case may be, you are implementing this strategy and someone comes in and try to help you. Um, oftentimes that leads to reinforcement that you don't want to occur. So those are things to keep in mind when you are developing your plan. And then reflecting on yourself, what, do I, what can I do? What can I change? Do I need to learn some new skills? How can I practice the skill? How can I replace this behavior of my own that in turn is creating part of this situation. What is my relationship with this child? What are the peer relationships with this child? Is there trauma? All those are things that you need to ask yourself to make sure that you are in the right place to implement the right intervention. And then I'm sorry, we're a minute over, but reflection. Um, if you guys think about the child you wrote about earlier, um, this can be a take home activity since we're out of time, but um, think about what the function of that behavior might've been. Was there a skill deficit? What behavior could you use to replace? Um, look at the self-reflection checklist. What can you teach that child or what would you have taught them child and what, or what would you have taught that child and what would you do differently now, if anything? Um, and so that's, I'm really sorry, we're out of time. Um, I will send the slides out if anybody wants to stay on for like some questions or whatever, I can hang back. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I'm also happy to like dig into more of this with anybody if you have specific scenarios. If any of you have specific things that are going on in your classrooms or with children that you're working with, you can go ahead and type up a little snippet of information about it and then see if Kelsey can help you work through those. Also, I'm totally sorry, we were not out of time. This goes till 1.30. I thought we started at 12. I am not well. So yeah, let's talk about your problems. Oh, attention seeking. Um, child reacts physically to other children in a negative way, such as pulling hair, scratching, hitting, and yelling. <clears throat> um, let's do attention first, um, just because that's a little easier without a lot of context. Um, what can we do for children who are just outright running around with all these attention seeking behaviors? Um, well, more attention for the right things, right? So catch them being good. Um, and there's the differential. Now that I know I have time, let me go back to my differential reinforcement video. Um, ignoring the behavior that, okay. So if a child's attention seeking by hitting, pushing and screaming and, and those types of things, 
you want to ignore that behavior and, and give the attention to the other children who are doing what they should be doing. And then as soon as that child stops or de-escalates the slightest amount, you want to go in really heavy with that reinforcement to, to reinforce those little subtle subtleties of calming down and de-escalating. Um, hang on. Sorry, Jamie, I, I really want to get into that one, but there's not, that, that's a big, like broad range of behavior with not a lot of like context. You know what I mean? Um, hang on. Okay. Let's do planned ignoring and differential reinforcement. This is a pretty good Friday's strategy not for easy, like almost everything. Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct. Four plus one, five. Great. And what about eight times two again? Sixteen. Awesome. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Thanks for trying, Craig. Just a lot of initiative. Thanks. Welcome. In this next clip, we will showcase another example of planned ignoring in conjunction with positive reinforcement. Two, one. All right, we'll start our activity as soon as everyone's sitting up. Crisscross out the socks, nice and silent. Brianna, that's looking great. Thanks for sitting quietly. Thank you, Jenna. We'll get started now. So we have a bunch of fruit and vegetables here, different colors. What I'm going to do is throw them all out, and I want to see how fast you can collect them all and put them back in the right label, okay? When I say go. And go. Good job, good effort. Yeah, that's a word. Good job. Excellent. Oh, Jenna, nice. Green and green. Good job. Go. Hello. In our last clip, you're going to see an example of positive reinforcement used as a daily routine in your classroom. All right, everyone. It is nearing the end of the school day. So I would like to you to do that quietly and effectively. Yeah. Excellent effort, Brandon. Alexa. Excellent work, you guys. Perfect. You guys did such an amazing job today. You get one more star. That makes 10. And you know what that means. Dummies. Yay! Okay. Whoops. Um, so the clip where the kids throwing the toys around and you know the one kid's cleaning it up. Um, Miss Candy and I used a very similar situation for a friend in um, her classroom recently, and it was quite effective. You know, you're going to see, that's another thing, when you start implementing these interventions, you're probably going to see an uptick in that behavior because it's, it's the gambling and the vending machine. If I try hard enough, you're going to break and, you know, things going to go back to the way they were. I'm going to get what I want. Um, once that consistency takes place, then you will see a decrease assuming all of your ABCs line up. Um, and then I'm going to get back to the chat in one second. We, we're, since we have time for the operant conditioning clip, um, we're going to look at this. It's, you know, it's a silly one, but think about how you can use very simple strategies like this to shape those little behaviors that are going to end up um, creating a bigger behavioral change. Friends would walk up to me and be like, what the f is in your mug? And I'll just tell them, I, can't, I, I don't mud. take the ads. Sorry. <laughs> Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. Thank you. 
Am I talking too much? I'm oh, sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate. Yes, oh, hey, Kim. Yeah. I... You know what? Hold on. Let me take this in the hall. You'll never guess who they got to replace me with work. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Sheldon, you can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ opera and conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. <laughs> Okay. Um, so that is shaping with operant conditioning. And again, I know that's like a silly one, but I think you can probably put some things together on how you can use those um, little opportunities to shape small behaviors throughout the day. Let me hang on, I'm just reading. Erica, I think those are great strategies. It's, I mean, at that age, that's a, you know, pretty typical um, behavior that kind of has a medical underlie to it. Um, I think those are great strategies other than, I mean, other than like a teether I don't know what else you could do with that without, I mean, is there like a behavior that goes with it? Is he like fussy when he doesn't have the teether? Things like that. This is hard to do via like chat box. Um, and I'm blind, so I'm gonna like blow this up. Um, physically, I have a point here. Do you need me to read them to you, Kelsey? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so with Kendra and Angie, um, hang on. Okay, so for with Kendra's um example, the ch child's kind of hoarding everything to themselves, and will resort to hitting other children as a result of the toy objects taken away. Um. Yeah, so it sounds like for that one, again, determining the function sounds like it's probably tangible. Things like visual timers um, to really practice that turn taking and waiting, that's probably a skill deficit. It is for most young kids. It's a skill deficit of mine, and I'm 32, so relatable. Um, but starting with very small increments, even if it's five or 10 seconds with a visual timer, having them wait and they get the toy right back that's difficult because then the other child's going to be like, Hey, wait, like I wanted that. Um, it's easier if you can contrive an opportunity to target those skills where the child's kind of playing with something by themselves that they like. So you don't have, don't wait for that peer to approach someone, you know, don't, don't wait for the altercation to start to try to teach that skill. Um, trying to find opportunities to work on these baby steps when they are happy, relaxed, calm, and engaged in their environment, you're going to have a way better outcome. It's the same thing. I always tell people, it's like you're arguing with your spouse and they say, you really need to calm down. No one has ever calmed down in the heat of a moment, in, in the heat of the moment by being told to calm down. It's just not happening. Um, we can't expect them to learn the new skill when they are in that state of fight or flight, regardless of what the situation is.
Oh, Suzanne, that's, that's a deep one. I have a lot of good strategies for that. Um, but it sounds like we probably have a, maybe a disability in there, um, or at least a lack of functional play skills. Definitely. Um, yeah, you need to do some play skills training, kind of teach them how to appropriately engage with materials by kind of expanding on what they'll already do, which is the lighting things up. I have, do you have my, can you email me? I'm going to put my email in here and you guys can, I, I have a lot of good strategies for that one. It's just, a. um, it's a, it's a deeper it's a deeper dive. Oh, okay, Erica. That one, I feel like I need to see. Um, because it could be a sensory thing, but it also could be some sort of escape. This is really difficult in this format. I'm sorry. Let me see. I feel like I skipped something. Do you need help? Kelsey. Huh? You good? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I didn't know everybody couldn't see um, okay. the question. No, I'm trying to pick the ones that are easy to talk about, like in this format without having any more information than what you can get in a chat box. And that's just not an easy thing to do. <laughs> Cassie, can you think of any other like generic um, things that would be easier to kind of dig into? Yes. So I know that they have a lot of issues with like if a child climbs on top of a table and is like refusing to get down. Like right. I know that that's something that they struggle with. Um, taking, their shoes taking their shoes off, not wanting to comply with those types of things, running around the classroom, just being defiant is I think is a big one in the classrooms and then also when they get so upset trying to get them to come down from being so upset so that they can talk to them okay um so the climbing um use less language i feel like we we talk we tend to over talk to children sometimes and we give them these big long explanations or really like dig into the rules and you know this and that and whatever um, it's really, you end up sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher and there's nothing, we're, we're not getting anything from that. Um, so really tone down the language, really short and concise instructions, feet on the floor, pick child up and put them on the ground, you know, and, and then redirect and immediately reinforce. Um, as soon as their feet hit the floor, be ready to engage them with something else and then tell them how wonderful it is that they have taken that redirection. Um, no, no matter how outrageous it has to be, you know, and then um, for the de-escalation, that's a young children have really big emotions and they don't often have the language to express that emotion. And that's why they're tantruming, right? Um, again, toning back the language and kind of giving them the words and, and acknowledging what you're seeing. I see that you are really upset. You can say, I'm upset or I'm mad, really validate the feelings. I see you're having a hard time, give them the words for it, and then try to shape that into helping them express, you know, that emotion before it's escalated to that point. Um, but really giving them that time to kind of calm down before you get into anything further than that and reinforce every, maybe they're screaming and like hitting their hands on the floor the second they scream a little bit quieter or they stop hitting their hands on the floor, I see how you've lowered your voice. Thank you. You're doing a great job calming down. Um, to try to really reinforce every little de-escalation that's involved until you know they're all the way down and then you can try to, to redirect to something else. 
the physical aggression, um, again, it's all about the function. Um, this one says, I have a child that screams all the time, no particular reason, not angry, just screaming. She also screams when upset, which is easier to help her with by helping her with words and visuals. She is verbal with limited language and can sign. She will request item or things as well, but just screams. I've tried to cover my ears each time saying, ow, loud. Is there a possibility? One thing you always have to rule out if it's not, if there, if it's something that isn't just blatantly obvious, is there potentially a underlying medical concern that needs to be addressed? Um, if not, and that's been ruled out and we have, we, it sounds like you have a communication in place and there, is there any antecedent, Suzanne, anything and no particular reason. So have you tried data on that? Sometimes we don't think there's a reason, but if you really like watch it, it could be something really minute. I would recommend trying to, um, no, not really. Okay. Um, that's hard to say without being able to see it, but medical, no. Okay. Um, Suzanne, have you, have the parents tracked any like time of day that this always happened? Have they like written anything down or have you noticed that it happens at the same time? It's all day. And it's, is it always to access something like food or toy or something like that? So if there's no antecedent, there's no medical underlying issue. Typically behaviors where there is no clear antecedent, they're typically sensory in function. And that's a really tough behavior. <laughs> if it's a, um, if it's, when a sensory behavior is something vocal like that, it's incredibly difficult to replace um, because you can't, there's nothing you can do to, you know, to, to give them whatever it is they're gaining from that. Um, on the spectrum though, ugh, it could be behavior. Now I want to see it. Suzanne, are you at partners? <laughs> I don't know everybody. Um, on the spectrum, I would go heavy on the visuals though, at any rate. Um, Suzanne does play therapy for partners. She does. Okay. Okay. Um, so children or people rather on the autism spectrum, they tend to process verbal stimuli slower than the neurotypical person does. Um, meaning by the time that you've gotten to like the third thing you're saying, they're still processing the first part of the first thing you said, and it becomes very overwhelming. Um, so I would go heavy on the visuals for that, but it definitely sounds like it's a, it's probably self-stimulatory and Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. I can find some strategies for you. I just, I'll have to dig into that one more. Suzanne, so thank you. Is there, um, <clears throat> with Jamie, the kid that she's talking about, I think, um, bites a lot, um, parent travels a lot. Um, inconsistent with who her caregiver is only child mom's pregnant and the child is very aggressive with other children pulling their hair scratching hitting yelling biting and how Jamie have you been able to determine the function of that behavior We thought maybe it was sensory before, um, but it's very inconsistent with, because she has a lot of language, um, very great language skills. We're not sure if it's attention or something else. She's one of the ones I wanted you to go see. Oh, I know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think that one's sensory. I would probably lean towards attention, even though I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity to really get you know, a, a lot of time with her, but it does seem like attention to me in that case. Um, you know, you could even try social stories to review classroom expectations every day 
And since it sounds like there's a lot of inconsistency at home, the more consistent things are at school, the less, you know, she's going to have to, to do those things to get the attention. However, um, there is a pretty hefty repertoire there of that skill, skill of that behavior. It's pretty drilled in. So it's going to be one of those that really takes a lot to teach a replacement, but I would try to provide all of the non-contingent positive reinforcement in the form of attention that you can um, give her. Like every, every, every couple of minutes, try to find something, even if she's doing nothing at all, that's better than aggression. Find something to reinforce about. Um, when another child is, so if she goes for another child and bites them or hits them, um, you know, put your body between them to separate them, give all the attention to the child that she has hurt. I'm sorry. So-and-so wasn't a good friend. You must feel sad. Does that hurt? Let me, you know, let me like, take care of that. Um, and just disengage from the other child so long as it's safe. Um, and then, you know, as soon as you find something positive to reinforce that child with, then throw that in there too. Um, something like timeout would be appropriate for her because it is attention. I also um, think that's the similar one that uh, Angie and Joanne are talking about too, is they have a child that attention seeks a lot and name calls. Yeah, and well, and the other thing too is as the kids get older, um, cause I was in Angie's classroom earlier this week and kids at that age, the other kids, they're kind of the rescuers um, that we kind of talked about, but not so much in the same way where you can try to ignore those comments, but there's always going to be that kid who's like, Hey, Ms. Angie, like she called me a name. Um, and Suzanne, those are all really, um, great redirections and alternatives. Um, we could, you could even do, um, overcorrection for like the name calling and the nitpicking at other kids. If you hear her, um, you know, insult somebody else, then, bring that child aside, explain to them why that wasn't a nice choice, and then have them come up with three or five things nice that they like about this person. And we're going to practice um, saying, you know, making nice comments to our friends or practice resolving whatever this conflict was in a different way. This is also a good time to, like with my daughter, with her attitude, when she would have an attitude, when she said something to me, I would say, oh, you can say that to me the right way. And I would make her say it back to me the right time, right way five times. And then before I could even get to like, oh, I guess you're going to say that to me the nice way. She'd be like, I mean, can I please have that? 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 Because I would have to make her physically stop what she was doing to say something the right way to me. Yeah, I love a good overcorrection. It's a good one. <clears throat> name calling in a school setting with a seven and eight year old oh so like you're the parent not is that is that what we were saying so you're it's happening like to your child and you're not yeah there. this is with her child okay. um that's hard because I know you're out you know you're not in control there um in that case obviously like reaching out to the teacher and trying to offer some strategies for in their classroom that's not typically received well. Um, you know, Angie, for your child, maybe working on just kind of the resiliency on what you can control. You can't control what people are going to say, but we can work on some resiliency and we can work on some strategies for how your child's going to handle that in the future. I actually, I have some good resources on that too. I'll send you some of those. Um, but yeah, it's, on the teacher, you know, so the most you can do in that situation is give your child some strategies for how they're going to handle that in the moment. Angie, also, if you want to sit down with Kelsey and give her more detail, she can come up with strategies that maybe you can send over to the teacher. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. Um, and I'll send you some stuff that I've got.
Anybody else? I'm sorry, I like blew through the last half of that because I thought I was out of time. And now here we are. Does anybody else have situations or behaviors that they see or have seen? Um, I'm sitting here in the resource room and someone said about elopement. Do you have any strategies for when kids run away from you? Yeah, well, again, what's the function? Um, in general though, yeah, the proximity. <laughs> like if they yeah. don't want to go inside from the playground. Um, is there something like a transition item or something they can look forward to going back into the classroom to access? Maybe have them pick something before they leave the classroom that they're really excited about. And that's, you know, have a visual when we're, when playground time's over, we're going to go in and, you know, you get to pick whatever it may be that you want for two or three minutes, whatever, whatever expectation works for your classroom and your routine, having something that they can look forward to, or even a little like basket or bag of a few things they do like, and that's going to be, you know, you come in and then you get two minutes to pick something from your bag to play with something that's going to compete outside super fun. Right. So what, how can we make that compete if they're not, what, what's, what are they going to look forward to when they go back in? I have a question um, from another CBRS provider that's not on here. Um, how do you redirect head banging when it's sensory um, for a child that has autism? Um, if the child, does the child have a helmet? That's just number one. They probably should. Um, we other yet, that, but we're working on it. Um, when it comes, when it comes to that, it really is about just being, um, close enough to redirect that with a hand or something soft, um, you know, to like soften the blow. Um, and then working on a lot of times, okay, let me back up with things like sensory behavior. So even back to, um, I think it was Erica's with like the chewing and the biting or the head banging. A lot of times if you, they're, they're, those are things that are comorbid with skill deficits, such as communication deficits, play deficits, um, social emotional deficits. And the, if we can identify where those deficits are and then work on building those skills, most of the time you will see self-injury self -injury and other sensory behaviors decrease um, as those other skills increase. So you have to have a solid plan, somebody that's within arm's reach pretty much all the time to be able to redirect that behavior to make it, make sure they're safe. They can hit their head on a pillow. They can hit their head on a couch, a beanbag, whatever, um, as long as it's safe. And then on the other side of it, filling in those developmental gaps. And most of the time as that increases, then you're gonna see those behaviors decrease. That sounds like a sensory thing too, probably. But that's an unfortunate pairing of events. Anybody else have a different one? Anybody else have any more questions or behaviors that they see? All right, well, if you guys don't have any more questions, if you want, or you have, if you think about later, um, some behavior questions that you have, um, you can email Kelsey. I'm going to put her email address in the chat for everybody. Um, and she can help you guys talk through things, but she needs a lot of details. So like what happened before, what happened during, and what happened after is going to 
help her to know how to best support you. Um, so if you have any questions about behaviors, um, you can email Kelsey. Um, I just put her email in the chat. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, 24 hours from right now, you will get a survey from Zoom. You're gonna fill out the survey. It'll let me know that you filled out the survey and then I will send you guys a certificate of completion for um, the one hour credit. Unless anybody has anything else, thank you for joining in today. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you guys. Yes, I can. Um, if Cassie has everybody's um, email addresses who registered, I can send the presentation out to everybody. Yes, we can do that.